Hey everybody, Adam Savage in my cave with an awesome show and tell with Kate Sabaker. Hello, Kate. Hello, Adam. Um, Kate built the Blade Runner blimp that we showed what is now, what, like seven or eight, 20, 25 years ago, something yeah, like that? Yeah, a couple okay. years ago. <laughs> <laughs> um, Kate is a master model maker, master painter, and has brought some bits of a movie she worked on to show us, and they are very instructive in terms of, I'm always talking about um, that a key skill for a model maker is prioritizing what needs your attention and what doesn't. Yes. Because you could build a perfect anything with enough time, but there's never enough time, so you have to choose your battles. 100%. That's, that's a good overview <laughs> yes, of this. Yes, yes, okay. definitely. What have you brought for us? So these are actually from the film Real Steel. Fighting robots with yeah, Hugh Jackman? Exactly. Uh, at one point, they go to a bit of a robot graveyard, if you will, sort of a junkyard that's full of just random body parts of robots. Great. And Sounds like my heaven. <laughs> the in-person practical set could only do so much. They had a few big crates. They had some machinery around them. But they wanted to do a big wide shot, sweeping shot, full of robot parts. So they came to New Deal Studios, where I was working, and said, we need you to plus out this bit. So they gave us the original footage. We saw the tiny corner that they actually had populated, and it was our job to fill the rest. So this is like a, 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 a what we would call a set extension. Yes. They had the shot. You're matching the camera's angle to that shot, but whereas it's only like, 10% of the screen, you're adding the other 90%. Exactly. Okay. So uh, our largest project for that was to create all of these different trash bins, basically, filled with bits of robot parts. I see some classic styrene construction here. Yes. So one of the, the aspects of this is I created patterns uh, which were, I laid out styrene strip and some bits of styrene sheet and created the different sides. I want to say, you know, there may be two different sides. There's a front and a side. Mm -hmm. That was then molded and cast. Uh, ooh, and ooh. They, I'm getting ahead of myself. Yeah. <laughs> uh, they then could create tons and tons of these pieces. Then somebody sat there, put them all together. Uh, then we have the other aspect, which is the junk that fills them. And that was a bunch of kit bashing from a lot of Gundam kits, model kits. That's what this, you got a little bit of styrene just to keep it up. Yep. And then this is a bit of molded detritus, is that right? Exactly. So you so, guys took a bunch of parts and made a casting Yeah, of we took a bunch of greeblies. We, we made a little square that looked like a good example of it. Yeah. And then that was molded and casted. And that way we could create tons of those to fill. Uh, obviously, we didn't need to fill the entire box of the right. interior there. So we took bits of styrofoam or whatever and glued that to the top of it, put that in there. So this was a way to create what looked like full bins when really it's just a little bit on top. This is sort of the way they, this is very much the way they did the uh, treasure in The Hobbit. Oh. Uh, the, the piles of gold coins were large sheets of castings of gold coins with gold coins sprinkled over them. Exactly, that way you have a few that look real tactile and loose, but really the, the bulk of it is something that's cheap and easy to, to put up there. Now, do you do like I do when you see a movie shot where you're sure there's no way that that's a real place, one, and two, that they built all the things. I start looking for the efficiencies. Yep, yep, yep. And a lot of times, like say, uh, if it is a pile of money or something like that, you'll see those defined coins on top, and then towards the edges, you might see them get pretty soft in there, the shadows drop off a little bit. It's kind of like being on Pirates of the Caribbean at Disneyland, where you're like, I see the real ones, and I see the fake ones. I will tell you that in that great scene in Breaking Bad, when, uh, when Buell, the big guy, uh -huh. is sitting on that giant storage space full of money, I looked at that money and I paused Breaking Bad and I was like, well, the next half hour for me is gonna be spent estimating how much that is. <laughs> and I literally freeze-framed, I figured out a rough distribution <laughs> of 20s and 100s, and then I made a flow chart, the weight and the size, and even considered compression. Oof. and. I was within $10 million. He no was like, it's, it's $110 million, and I'd come up with like $100 million. 
<laughs> that, that, is, that is respectable. I li- I'm so glad that you did that. <laughs> it, 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 it required. It yes. required a little bit of math. Okay, so talk about. You said here you didn't have to show all the garbage underneath here, sure. but on this one you do. Yeah. So you see, these ones were a slightly different construction. Again, the frames were mass uh, produced, and then the insides we laid in some right. wire mesh. Now you can see some of the junk that's in there, and again, the top is a casting so that you can see the more detailed bits. But let's see, oh, if, let's it's see if it'll pull out. There you go. Like tinfoil. Yeah, so you've got, again, a styrofoam block wrapped in, I believe, some black wrap. Yeah. And then squished up so that it looks like crunched metal. And then what the genius painters did was since each of these parts got a different color, they carried that paint scheme throughout. And that's the real brilliance of yeah. knowing how to prioritize because this is the kind of place where film model making is way less detailed than model train modeling. 100%. Because the camera's gonna go past this and you're never gonna take it in, especially through the grate. It's a it's a brilliant like efficiency. I'm noticing, okay, years ago, I was looking at a book of ship cutaways and a friend of mine from Pixar was like, oh, that's a great book. Those Drawings are so detailed. And I said, yeah. And he goes, let's find the joke. And I was like, what joke? And he goes, no one who had to draw anything that in- intricate is going to, it's going to, it's soul crushing to draw that much. <laughs> they had to have included some kind of little They're joke. They're going to slip something in uh-huh. there. And sure enough, on every page, you could find someone pooping. <laughs> and this kid's book is great. Way off in the corner, some guy like behind a door. So what I'm noticing here is, is, is a commonality. I notice. You said these were made from Gundam figures? Yes. That's the the detritus, which is great, because like kids' toys have wonderful curves and details. Oh, yeah. But I'm noticing a fist, <laughs> and I'm noticing another fist, and I'm noticing, I think there's even a third, fi- yeah, there's there? another one. So it's just, <laughs> this is what model makers do to occupy yep. themselves when they have to do something over and over again. And it's a good way too, I think, to try and separate this out, you know, these aren't, uh, airplane parts. These right, aren't random right. automotive parts. Like those are body Robots, parts. Yes. Yeah. Oh yeah. So that's not even a joke. That is like it's robot parts. <laughs> I don't know. I like. I I would try and stick as many hands in there as I could too. I, I totally would. Or I'd, uh, <laughs> you include like logo of a non company. Yep. You've done that one. Yep. Yep. Totally. Well, I mean, on the blimp, I. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and so these were. These were both laser cut and cast in different in different formulations, or were these all cast? Back uh, then, these are all cast. Yeah. Uh, I believe I made the patterns to all of these out of styrene, wow. and then they were molded and cast. Yeah, we did not. We definitely did not have an in-house laser cutter. Yeah, we would send stuff out occasionally to get professionally done, but only if we could spare the cash. Sure. So, yeah. That's yeah. Ho- yeah. It gets expensive <laughs> in a hurry. This is so beautiful. I I love. I love how much storytelling you can do with less detail than you'd imagine. Right? Yeah, I just, I thought it was a great way to showcase how much the eye is willing to believe with the minimal amount put in. Right. Um, Fawn Davis and I were on the phone the other day and he was talking about the old convention we used to say is, will it look good on film? Hold on, let me see. Yeah, it looks fine. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and that's literally, we. What Fawn and I built a building for episode two. It was the first ILM set extension to be filmed in digital. Oh, wow. And all of us were nervous, right? We went really, I remember doing lighting tests on the thickness of the Venetian blinds we had acid etched. (laughs) And in the end, it worked fine, but like it was a much higher level of detail than the standard 24 frames. Yeah. And to speak earlier, um, how you said that how this was meant to be a set extension, this was an interesting one to film because I feel like a lot of the model shots uh, I had filmed before, it would be, you know, the model stands on its own and they they shoot it from whichever angle kind of looks right, but it's mostly about what works best for them. This one, we got so complicated with math and angles. There were C stands that were measured precise distances apart with a few of them resting up here and then oh, one set yeah. over here and they were spread out at precise points and constantly being checked back to make sure it would fit the original. And of course, that was the scene of my horrible, embarrassing mess up where I had to crawl between them to fix something and on my way back out, you, tip you, something you over? bump one, with, one <laughs> with your butt and then it like dominoes. And I just thought I was gonna die. It was, oh. it was so mortifying. 
I had the most wonderful crew chief who jumped right in. It was in front of our owner and everything, jumped right in and said, you know what? I was on a job once and I did this terrible thing and I thought I was gonna die, but it was totally okay. And then the owner jumps in and goes, actually, I did one too. And pretty <laughs> soon everybody was commiserating. Nobody was mad. We reset. I was like so focused, but it actually helped save me. I think if somebody hadn't reassured me like that in the moment, I probably wouldn't have been able to focus the rest yeah. of the day. But that kindness, help me jump in there and like get back to work. Right, everyone's there on the film set costing whatever many, many dollars per minute and your heart just <laughs> yep. How long did you guys have to put this set together? I wanna say standard for us was about three months. I think this one was a bit shorter. I wanna say a month and a half. We had both this set, which also included a giant sort of railing system. I want to say, imagine like a, a gondola robot that would go down and pick some of oh, these nice. things up. Yeah. And I was in charge, I, I brass soldered that whole thing together. A month and a half to do that and this set? And there was a Gundam that stood outside of an arena. It was like a gigantic Gundam that people could walk through its legs. And that was a model that we created an original Gundam for. Wow. So that was part of it as well. Um, yeah. So, I mean, I, you might, if you're a beginning model maker, you might think, wow, a month and a half or three months to do a thing. That time disappears so quickly, especially yeah. with the parts management. Your mold shop wants to know precisely how many you want, yep. and you don't know at the beginning. Well, you only know once they've started to churn them out. Yep. And then they, you know, if you want to change the amount that you're getting per day, they get salty about it. <laughs> exactly. It is a whole thing. <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah, it, it can spiral out of control very quickly, too. I think <laughs> that the giant Gundam we made um, was largely made by vacu forming. Mm -hmm. Somebody was carving them out of ren shape, um, and then we were we were vacu forming on top of it. And every other day, somebody would mess up the vacu form on one piece of it, and then that would set us back. And so it was like <laughs> you were constantly trying to keep up with it. Um, but luckily, you know, when you're having to make a ton of these, yep. that just starts to go. You're on a production line at that point. So I, I love the behind the scenes of this kind of production because you then have somebody pushing like a sandwich cart with like 200 of these exactly. on it. And someone's immediately throwing them onto the set and someone's using some streaks and tips to tie it together. Yep. And Yeah. Um, tell me about after it was all set up, you got to see it. You got to see the camera shot. Yeah. How's that? I have to say, I was quite impressed. It was one of those things where when I was on set, I was having trouble seeing it, especially because this was such a funky setup yeah. where there were different le level C stands spaced out. And I was just sitting there going like, I, I don't really know how this is gonna look, if it's really gonna be a totally cohesive shot. And then I saw the, the wide shot and I was like, Oh, that looks great. <laughs> oh, I totally buy that. <laughs> um, it's very similar to the way they did the Hades landscape in Blade Runner. Oh, wow. Um, there are, there are you know, large, uh, what do you call it, cutaway silhouettes of buildings mm -hmm. for things to be seen in front of and behind. Multiple levels in forced perspective. But then towards the camera, as the camera is moving, again, things placed just shot by shot to give visual, something interesting visually. Yeah. Oh, that's so good. But that that looking at it at the first time, that's that's the thrill. Yeah. That's where you get to see how, how your work shows up. I definitely saw, like, I think there was a panning shot or some wide dramatic shot, and you see, like, a small Hugh Jackman, like, walking in the corner in their tiny practical bit. And honestly, if I hadn't worked on it, I probably wouldn't have even thought about the fact that all the rest of that was, was faked. That's so awesome. Um, Kate, thank you so much for bringing these beautiful yes. pieces and showing us. Thanks for talking with me about it. It's always much more fun with somebody who has the inside information. <laughs> uh, I, I, I never get tired of this stuff. And like when one of these sets gets torn down, that's also a nice thing because, you know, the production company isn't saving every last bit. Everyone gets a little bit of something for their home collection. Exactly. And that's as it should be. All right. Thank you, guys. Uh, have a good day and we'll see you next time. Hey everybody, Adam Savage here in my cave with the amazing Kate Sabaker, who careful watchers of this channel might remember uh, as having helped me birth and done all, all of the hard work birthing a blimp from Blade Runner. And uh, this is a terrible segue. Shall we start again? <laughs> <laughs> that was that's for Instagram. I'm working on the next one, right? <laughs>